Uh, I'm Allison Stanger, Director of the Roatan Center for International Affairs, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's session of the International Studies Colloquium. Uh, a few words about how this all works, because I see a lot of new faces out there. Lunch is served throughout the program. We're very informal. Uh, the speaker knows we're informal, so you should feel free uh, to go up and get coffee or dessert or something you missed, and we will conclude promptly at 1.30. I'd now like to turn the floor over to Professor Linda White, who will introduce our distinguished guest today. So, Professor White. Thank you all for coming. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to thank the programs and departments who generously supported this visit. Thanks go to the Rahatan Center for International Affairs, Women and Gender Studies, the Japanese Department, the International Studies Program, Wanakot Commons, and the First Year Seminar Fund. It's a great pleasure to introduce the Bass Distinguished Professor and Chair of Cultural Anthropology at Duke University, Dr. Ann Allison. Ann is one of the foremost scholars of contemporary Japanese culture, and her work has consistently set the standards in our field for both ethnographic insight and critical rigor. From her first research on corporate masculinity in the after hours drinking establishments of Tokyo, and through each of her subsequent studies, Professor Allison has examined crucial but often overlooked and under theorized aspects of Japanese society, shedding light on contemporary gender relations, late capitalist social structures, and the complexities of popular culture. I'm really short. Her book, Nightwork, was a groundbreaking study of the role of masculinity in the creation of Japan's economic success, as seen from the tables of a meticulously evoked and documented hostess club in Tokyo. She followed this work with permitted and prohibited desires, which takes on topics ranging from kids' cartoons to Iro manga and lunchboxes, exposing the mechanisms by which desire is created and deployed in contemporary Japan, and revolutionizing our thinking about the way a culture constructs values and taboos. Most recently, Millennial Monsters examines the enchanted commodities of Japanese pop culture, from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers to Pokemon, evoking the relations of production and consumption for these globally desired J. Cool products. Professor Allison's work has been published in the major journals in the field of anthropology, Japanese, and women's studies. Her research has been supported by the Japan Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and the Fulbright Commission, among others. The list is long. This quick tour through what is truly an extraordinary curriculum vita does not begin to give a true picture of the influence Anne has had on the field of Japanese studies and the way her work has shaped our understanding of power, gender, and the fundamental social and psychological structures of contemporary Japanese society. Anne is an enormously generous colleague and friend, and it's a huge pleasure to have her in Middlebury. Please join me in welcoming Professor Anne Allison. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here on such a beautiful day, and I would like to thank all the people who made it possible for me to come here, but I won't repeat them all because I don't remember them all, but thank you. And I would like to thank in particular Linda White, who is a very good friend, and her partner Steve Snyder, who is also a very good friend. And I have to admit that seeing them again was one of the motivating reasons for me to come and also to see your beautiful campus, so thank you very much. Um, the paper I'm giving, I'm going to read it. Um, I apologize for reading it, but it's brand new, and it's very much a work in progress. So I realize that it ends a little bit abruptly and not really with a conclusion. So I'm just going to warn you, if you're looking for a conclusion, you're not really going to get one. Um, the title of the paper is The Sociality of Neoliberalism, Affect, Family, and Japanese Kids. The event was iconic of the much decried dissolution of human relations in 21st century Japan. On May 17, 2007, a 17-year-old boy killed his mother, then dismembered her head along with one arm. Occurring sometime after midnight, he then bicycled to a karaoke club and later to an internet cafe. Then around dawn, the boy took a taxi to the police station where, still carrying his mother's head in a bag, he confessed. 
As the media reported it, the youth had stopped going to school about a month before and was taking medication for anxiety, for which he had been briefly hospitalized. Before that, however, he had been a good student. In fact, it was in order to attend a highly ranked high school that both the boy and his younger brother were living together in an apartment away from home. That day, the mother made an unexpected visit to clean up her son's apartment. Staying the night, she became the victim of an urge to kill that overcame the boy, whose first thought had been his brother. But his younger brother was too strong, and the boy chose his mother instead. According to his lawyer, the act was not motivated by any particular resentment the boy held against his mother. Indeed, as the lawyer also reported, the boy was unclear as to who he had actually killed after the fact, a stranger or his mother. What intrigued me about this case, someone interested in the relationship between sociality, capitalism, and youth, was the geometry of affection and disaffection it singled. A boy who kills his mother then spends hours entertaining himself with karaoke and communicating in cyberspace before turning himself in. All the while, he carries with him his mother's head. Why the head, I wondered. Was it meaningful? The sign of a deep attachment to at least the idea of mother, family, and home? Or was it a sign of the very absence of meaning and effective attachment, a mother not regarded as a mother, a human reduced to a severed head? And why take the head with him? To remind him of the mother he'd once had or of the murder he had just committed? When I read of this case, I thought, strangely perhaps, of the research I have recently completed on the global traffic of Japanese youth properties like Pokemon and Tamagotchi that serve, among other things, as a form of portable intimacy. A user can pull out her Tamagotchi or Game Boy anywhere, anytime, and access an imaginative world of animate, albeit virtual, beings with which to bond. The boy with his mother's head in a bag. A perversion of the type of portable intimacy in, sorry, a perversion of the type of portable intimacy at work in a Pokemon or Tamagotchi, the mother becomes a portable possession, much like Pokemon, but she has also been killed and would seemingly signify not portable intimacy, but intimate death. Yet portable intimacy in the case of Tamagotchi, for example, can quickly turn to a kind of death as well. When a player is tired of her virtual pet, she simply stops playing. The pet dies, and the Tamagotchi returns to being just an inanimate object, a plastic egg shoved to the back of a drawer. When the desire for a virtual playmate arises again, a player touches the reset button and rebirths another pet. I do not mean to be glib here by comparing the killing of a human to the operation of a toy. Rather, I'm interested in the different sets of effective investments at work in 21st century Japan, and in particular, the organization of sociality under neoliberalism and the interrelationship between family, affect, and youth. A question I have been pondering for a while is the relationship, both effective and otherwise, between the family and capitalism today. For the family is not or no longer the institutional prop or effective tethering to national production the way it was under the Enterprise Society of Japan, Inc. That is, in the post-war period of high economic growth through the bursting of the bubble economy in 1991, 95%, I'm not sure that that statistic is right, something like, <laughs> something like 95% of the population identified themselves as middle class, a designation heavily linked to family and an increasingly nuclear, nuclearized one. Doing well and being successful was measured in large part by providing for family. And if a child doing well in school, ranking high in entrance exams into high school, then university, and achieving material prosperity greater than one's parent as an adult, hard work 
and high performance at home, in school, at work, was anchored in, fostered by, and calibrated to the family. Or to be more specific, a very particular construction of family, heteronormative with stay-at-home mom, white-collar father, and 2.2 kids, all high achieving and ensconced in regiments of corporate capitalism, regiments of cram school, homework, and test taking, became sutured to the national economy of corporate capitalism in post-war Japan. It is this model of family, as well as real-life families in Japan that are said to be collapsing in this post-bubble moment of national unease. But alongside, or as part of, the collapse of family is the collapse of the middle class, what has been variously called, as by Yamada Masahiro, a bipolarized society of upper and lower class, and by Miura Atsushi, a downturning or downturned society, Karyu Shakai. In the face of layoffs, restructuring, and rising unemployment, adults are losing jobs and the security of their middle class livelihood. The message this sends to youth is that, is that the path to a prosperous adulthood upheld by their parents, studying hard for exams, entering a good university, obtaining or marrying into a job for life, is no longer guaranteed. Indeed, in an era when the so-called corporate warriors of the 70s and 80s are committing suicide at an increasingly high rate, the promise of middle-class citizenship is at risk. At risk, too, is the family. If by family we mean the model outlined above, a heterosexual couple plus kids ensconced in and reproductive of middle-classness. And signs that such a family structure is waning are ample. The lowering of the birth rate, shoshika, the delay and decrease of young adults marrying, and the high rate of divorce, one out of every three marriages today. In his 2003 book entitled Kazoko Risk, The Risk of Family, Yamada Masahiro argues that it is the very ebbing of middle class security that is at the root of the dissolution of the Japanese family today. Young women, for example, refrain from both marriage and childbirth, largely according to a number of studies, because they refuse to marry someone who cannot assure them and any children they would have a middle class lifestyle. Their resistance to marriage, that is, is not because they lack the desire to marry and become mothers. Indeed, according to one poll, 90% of unmarried Japanese in their 20s and 30s actually want to marry and have a family. But the employment status more and more young people are inhabiting, that of moving from job to job in a pattern of free-floating labor called frita, or even less stable, of NEET, N-E-E-T, not in education, employment, or training, inhibits marriage. Young women say they will not marry a Frita, and Frita males say they cannot support a family or a wife. Despite or because of this, becoming a Sengyo Shufu, a full-time housewife, is the number one dream of young Japanese women today, even that of Gyaru, who hang out in Shibuya after dropping out of school. The image connotes financial security, and an everydayness of playing tennis, shopping for brand name goods, and sending children to juku, cram school. That the reality of this is becoming futile makes the persistence of the fantasy striking. Death of family, fantasy of being a housewife, murder of mother, toys of portable intimacy. Interrogating the connections between these various sites and expressions of capitalism, affect, family, and youth in this moment of the early 21st century is the aim of my paper today. And to be clear at the outset, my intent here is to be more exploratory than conclusive, for what I present constitutes the very beginning rather than the end of a new research project about which I invite any and all feedback. 
But to foreshadow my in conclusion, what I see haunting all of these phenomena is an anxiety about and desire for what is alternatively called security, ante, a space of one's own, ibasho, pursuing selfhood, jibunsa, and sociability, shako, a sense, in other words, of being at home, either oneself or in a space where one feels comfortable being around others. What I would like to propose is that this is a quest for home that is family-like, if not necessarily familial, as in father-mother kids, a home where one is not alone, where effective connection is felt to confirm, even center the self, and that is accessible wherever one goes, a portable home, a mobile family. What I am spelling out is a sociality where individuals can be free, be themselves, be connected. A sociality, as I will argue, or more argue, as I will suggest, a sociality of neoliberalism. The next section is called Dreams, Futures, Risks. In a recent study of teenagers put out by the advertising firm Hakahoto, girls were asked about their dreams for the future. Overwhelmingly, they answered what they wanted were moderate lives, hodo hodo no seikatsu, that would assure them of safety, ante. If they were to work, they wanted this to be an, more of an ordinary job than as a career woman, particularly if the latter involved risk. The ideal would be marrying early and having children, though concretely, Few had clear-cut plans or ambitions for the future. Compared to the previous generation and certainly that of their parents, these girls sensed a loss. Rather than moving forward, they felt that Japan and the prospects it held for them was devolving. Specifically, it was the pension problem, even more than the instability of jobs that fueled their sense of anxiety. Anxious about the future, the future becomes unimaginable. No wonder that these girls were vague about the future and not particularly enthused about becoming adults. Indeed, as another study discovered, Japanese youth today would prefer to stay as kids, which is tanoshi, enjoyable, rather than grow into adults, a period they associate with worry, stress, and responsibility. Larry Grossberg, among others, has argued that loss or anxiety about the future is a symptom of our times in general. The narrative of modernity was progress, the belief in an investment towards a future that would improve for future generations. As Grobesberg points out, youth have always embodied the future under a modernity committed to a long-term timeline and the commitment to future betterment. But modernity is in crisis, or at least getting unsettled in an era of neoliberalism, where attention is paid much more to present gains than future payoffs, and capital is geared to risk and speculation rather than savings and labor. As Jeremy Rifkin puts it, youth today are being socialized to be consumers in the present rather than investors in the future. Time has become reorganized. And the role, place, and value of the future has diminished. In such a reorganization of capital and time, youth and their value to society get reconfigured as well. And one of the effects this has on kids, according to Grossberg, is that in not being able to imagine the future, kids are deprived of imagination altogether. But even worse, in losing its sense of futurity, society itself is losing its capacity to care for children. In the case of the US, the statistics are so horrifying, one in five raised in poverty, for example, that Grossberg considers America to be at war with children. Societies are or should be mechanisms for the distribution of hope, according to Ghassan Haj and the kind of effective attachment citizens hold towards society reflect on the latter's capacity 
to generate hope. In his book, Against Paranoid Nationalism, Searching for Hope in a Shrinking World, Hodge discusses two kinds of affective attachment, caring and worrying. Whereas caring is an intersubjective affect, worrying is narcissistic and the product of an insecure attachment to a nation that is no longer capable of nurturing its citizens. Hope is critical here and it relates to the future, what Eric Fromm calls a vision of the present in a state of pregnancy. How citizens hope depends on our relationship to this pregnant present and is something a capitalist society produces and generates through various means. One is by national identification, allowing citizens or certain citizens to see themselves as belonging to the nation. The second is the possibility of social mobility, the modernist project of projecting hope that the future will be better materially, economically, socially, at least for one's children. And the third is what, what Hodge calls societal or social hope, the deep-seated belief in the importance of our life pursuits, future, or social selves. When a society fails to dispense hope in one or all of the above ways, citizens experience a care deficit, which depletes their own capacity to care for others. It also leads, according to Hodge, to social death. Japan certainly seems to have entered an era of hopelessness. The papers, bookstores, and public culture in general are filled with stories about how Japanese today lack hopes, ideals, or investment in the future. In particular, it is youth who are said to be hopeless, embracing behaviors like frita, neat, and jokosai, and runaway consumer gratification youth don't seem to be moving towards the future at, or at least a future as once defined by Japan Inc. And in their own accounts, youth often have di difficulty articulating what it is they do want or believe in or are committed to. Jumping from job to job and staying out of marriage, even if they say they desire this, youth seem to be stuck in a presentist mode that is not, as Fromm said of hope, in a state of pregnancy. As Murakami Ryu said in what is a much cited quote from his novel, Kibo no Kuni no Ekosodasu, The Exodus of a Country of Hope, Japanese had nothing but hope after the war. And today, Japanese have everything but hope. In a concept much adopted particularly by adults, hope is something one needs to work for with a vision of a future that is progressively better. In the years of defeat and devastation following the war, Japanese worked hard to rebuild their country. Held out before them was the process of increased security, comfort, and wealth, both at the personal and national level. And by the 1980s, this had been largely achieved, an era when 95% of the population could identify with a national citizenship of the Japanese middle class. But where does one go? when the futurist goals of a nation, of a citizenship, have been attained. In the words of one Japanese writer, the country had slumped into a pathology of abundance by the 1980s, the era of high speculation, lavish spending, and bubble lifestyles. And in this culture of materialism, commodities have become the new social language not only mediating relationships, but also constituting subjectivity, a subjectivity of ownership, consumer individualism. In an era, in the words of Ohira Ken, of mono no katari no hishitobito, people who speak things. It is also an era, particularly with the bursting of the bubble economy in 1991, triggering the post-bubble moment of national unease and collective anxiety. It is a moment marked by social death in Hodge's terminology. A moment when effective attachment to the nation comes more in the form of worrying than caring. A moment of unclear futures and stress-filled or consumer-ridden everydays. A moment when teenage girls crave safety more than anything else. And a moment when young adults live ever longer when their parents, saving on rent, and spending whatever they make on themselves in a pattern commonly referred to as parasite singles. The next session is called 
social death, post-familial hope. So where is the family in all this? Is it a cushion to the kind of social death and national panic Japan as a whole has fallen victim to? Or are families part of the problem, part of a society that fails to generate and distribute hope, a society deficient in care and a futurist imagination? The boy who killed his mother then took her dead head with him to karaoke and an internet cafe. Can we read into this a failure of the Japanese family to reproduce and a sign of where and what is seen as life-giving to a youth, not a mother, but the technologized, virtualized realm of electronic entertainment? In what would seem to be a similar incident in 2001, a boy killed his mother with a baseball bat. When he was found headed north on a bus, his backpack was filled with only one thing, Pokemon cards and Pokemon Game Boy games. A world of imaginary monsters and virtual vistas that offers children a space of their own. Uh, one, as one of its promoters said of Pokemon to explain its widespread appeal with kids. The term Jibun no Kukan, space of one's own, I heard time and time again when doing research on electronic toys like Pokemon referencing both the imaginative expanse of this play world and also the deep libidinal power it held for kids. Sometimes the point was made that the ties children forge with these imaginary worlds stand in for or make up for something lacking in their own lives, something familial, home life, caregiving. Speaking of Pokemon, Watanabe Naomi said, the catching a Pokemon monster always gives kids the message, you're great. Such self-confirmation she called unconditional love, which she said Japanese children are lacking elsewhere in the so-called real space of home, school, and society. Similarly, a researcher for Hakahodo told me that the effective attachments youth make with electronic toys, character merchandise, and virtual playthings operate like shadow families. The bonds formed are deep, deeply libidinal, and family-like. Didi Franchi, an author in Tarento, put this slightly differently. In speaking about the fetishistic quality of Japanese character merchandise, the way in which youth, but also adults, buy, collect, and adorn their bodies with character emblazoned handbags, pencil cases, phone straps, briefcases, t shirts, bobby socks, shoes, he said that parents die, but characters live forever. A chilling commentary on the animation given things in Japan and the death or murder of parents. In a recent publication put out by an NPO, nonprofit organization, working for troubled youth, the Nihon Soshawaku Kyokai, the, oath, the authors write that one of the key issues facing young people today is the desire for and absence of ibasho, a word that translates as a place to feel at home a place where one can be oneself. Across a range of kids who run away from home, drop out of school, sell their bodies on the street, or retreat into their rooms, their narratives continually come back to a feeling of alienation. In the Marxian sense, alienation is having the essence of one's species being, labor in Marx's opinion, sutured, cut off from oneself, and sold or transacted like an alien thing. Being reduced to or treated like a thing is how children at the Nihon Social Work Center spoke of lives that deprived them of dreams and failed to nurture their real selves, Jibunsa. He was killed on the inside as one youth portrayed his existence after parents took away his one passion, the guitar, so he could concentrate all his energies on studying for upcoming entrance exams. As this child described his behavior before succumbing to a depression that made him retreat into his room for years, a pattern called hihihimori, which translates as social withdrawal. He attempted to be the kind of child his parents, teacher, and society wanted, studying hard, sacrificing everything for academic performance. He'd been what is conventionally labeled a good kid, eiko. And indeed, this is the only sphere where he could count on being complimented or even recognized by his parents, and even then, he rarely got praised. This boy was raised in a middle-class home. His father was a Saturday mom, and his mother a stay-at-home mom. Their hope had been to reproduce themselves and their child, 
to see him enter a good university, acquire a secure and well-paying job, and eventually start a family of his own. And this hope was based on a social contract, what Yamada Masahiro has said was both standard and constitutive of the family and its middle classness in post-war Japan. Operating like a gift exchange, parents gave material comfort to their children and children performed according to the social script of study hard, pass entrance exams, attend good college, get job, marry, have kids. It is this social contract that is crumbling in this post post-war era of the 90s and new millennium. And every part of it, according to Yamada, is at risk. The job market has become unstable, which means that even a college degree doesn't ensure full-time employment. And for this reason and others, kids are less inclined to adopt the social script. Thus, they become free to meet, fail to marry or have kids, study less and stay on the streets more. And for their part, parents with a divorce rate of one in three and with the instability of the economy are less inclined to stay together and less able to maintain a prosperous middle class home. These are risky times. And the family wants the safety net for people itself is a site of risk today. But how precisely safe was the family under the post-war agenda of national middle classness? And despite all the riskiness of contemporary times, might the very crumbling of this construction of family, the edifice of middle classness, and the social contract underlying and tying both be productive of something new. New forms of effective attachment, a different arrangement of sociality, the germination of something akin to hope. In his book about being a self-identified hikikimori for one year, Ju Yon Sai, uh, being 14 years old, Chihara Junya describes a condition of social death. Tormented for being different by neighborhood housewives, the mothers of his would-be friends, school teachers, and other kids, Chihara stops going to school at the age of 14 and becomes a recluse confined to his room. Pacing the floor, staring out the window, smoking cigarettes, watching the static on his TV at the end of the night, these become his everyday routines along with playing with imaginary bugs, a sign perhaps he's becoming psychotic and an occasional bike ride outside in his PJs. Keenly aware of his parents' disappointment <laughs> and his mother's attempt to medicate him with antidepressants in his food, Chihara refuses all interactions from communication to meal taking. <laughs> Through them, particularly his mother, he feels and rejects the pull of social expectation to adopt the script assigned him of attending school, performing on exams, aiming for a respectable career. Socially dead, he also lashes out in attempts to, if not kill, then wreak violence on his family, punches to the wall, holes to his home. But throughout, though tormented, he never quite abandons the desire to find a way out, an alternative route, a place of his own. The text is peppered with such queries. Who am I? What am I? What will I do in life? Where will I go? He also keeps playing out an imaginary conversation with his parents. I'm just different from others, and I need to find a path, path of my, my own. I'm searching now. I'm seeking a path just for me. So wait a, long, a little longer, a little longer, please. In the end, after he attempts to re-enter school and flees again, spurring his mother to tell him she can't stand the humiliation this has caused in the neighborhood, and then he must move away. Chihara gets a phone call from his older brother, suggesting they meet a train ride away in Osaka. The brother takes Chihara to a social group where people tell stories intended to make others laugh. His own term comes at the next meeting where he agrees with great trepidation to return. And the story he tells of humiliation at the hands of a teacher amuses the others. Why it amuses them, I don't know, but he tells it in a funny way, I guess. So starts the next phase of the boy's life. Life here didn't work, so he's striking out. As he tells his returning home, Chihara packs his gear and tells his parents he's leaving for Osaka. Life here didn't work out, so he's striking out now at age 15 for something new with the intention of never returning to school or the path that they had laid out for him. And as Japanese readers of the book will know, Chihara Jr. succeeds. He becomes a successful comedian. 
my conclusion, which is called sociality of a present. The word jibun, self, figures highly in the story Chihara Jr. tells. Disconnected from the world outside because it rubs him and he it the wrong way, the boy holes up in a room, a room at home, with a family he disavows. And from this vantage point, at a home that is not home, he searches for himself, for a space of his own. The geometry of affection is striking here, for while alienated from home, the boy doesn't actually leave home for quite a while. And once he does, looking for his ibasho, place to be himself, the model he takes is grounded in part by that of family. As a set of effective re relations that endures over time, there is no other model, according to the director of the Nihon Social Work Center, who says the troubled youth she treats are seeking an ibasho that is also family-like, if not precisely family per se, to be both connected and disconnected, at home with others, and at home, most importantly, with oneself. Familial attachment, but with the detachability of an individual, individualized self. This would seem to be the principle behind Tamagotchi, a toy of virtual, portable companionship that the owner controls and disposes of at her will. It would also seem to be the logic of what has become an, a new and increasingly common practice of youth, to stay away from home, sometimes days and nights at a time, but stay connected to parents by making a daily phone call on one's keitai, keitai denwa cell phone. The practice called puchi iede translates its minor truancy from home, <laughs> a rootedness to family that is disrooted all the same. What is this? The death of family? Crisis of the imagination of futurity? The dissolution of sociality? Or rather, is this a sociality for the times? For these 21st century, post-Japan Inc., free marketplace, risky, presentist times? A sociality of the present, of a present whose pregnancy must be nurtured, as in Shihara Jr.'s case of becoming a comedian, a, so a sociality of, but perhaps also beyond, neoliberalism. Thank you. Okay. I'm happy to take questions. Yes, Allison. Um, that was wonderful. <laughs> and, and really, I really want to give you Thank more you. to think about. Thanks. I, I'm not a Japanologist. Uh, I study Europe and the United States. And I was struck yeah. by your description of Japan in 2007 as being quite similar to the social dislocation that occurred in Britain during the Industrial Revolution, a huh. time of profound social huh. change. Huh. And that got me to thinking yeah. that if the response to industrialization at that point, was a newly forged identification with the nation. Might it not be the case that one possible response to what you're describing is identification with the world? That if you're breaking up old yeah. social ties, yeah. Yeah. a new identification yeah. would be with the world, with the global yeah. citizens, citizens yeah. which would be a progressive development. Yeah. Yeah. So, so part, of, part, yeah. part, part of me is thinking, um, you know, maybe this is a really good thing that uh, the Japanese have stopped identifying with the nation. Not that we've been troubled in the past. So <laughs> that is deep. Indeed. In in well, you know, that's, that's, that's wonderful. And there are other Japanologists in the room, so perhaps we could also invite them for their comments. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Being attached to the nation is not necessarily a good thing. And if this could be a post-national um, attachment more to the globe, that might be a really, it could be a really good thing. And I'm, I'm reminded of Lisa Rofel has just written a book um, where, called Desiring China. And she has a chapter called, um, what is it, Cosmopolitanism with Chinese, character, Chinese Characteristics, where she's arguing 
that at this particular moment of time in China, there is precisely this desire to connect to the world, but in a Chinese kind of way. So her argument is that even though you connect to the world, it doesn't mean necessarily that you, that you lose nationalism. And in the case of Japan, at least in the case of the youth who I have been talking to and thinking about this issue with, yeah, maybe there is a sense of going beyond Japan, but there also seems to be, I don't know, um, a sense of, I don't know where we're at right now, and I'm just kind of trying to get through each day, and I don't necessarily get a sense that there is this, this kind of reaching out to a place beyond Japan. But I, in part, what I think would be an interesting argument is to say the way that the family was so wrapped into Japan Inc., that was a part of nationalism, that if we can break out of that, yeah, that could be something that would be very positive and very progressive. I, I don't, my sense is we're not, we're not there yet. Um, and so it'll be kind of interesting to see um, what, what happens. But that's, that's, that was an excellent comment. Thank you. Yeah. And my sense is that this is exactly the quest and desire that's happening with Japanese youth, and there's not necessarily an answer. I mean, I, I agree. I think there's this incredible desire to belong somewhere to someone, with someone. And the relationship to family is interesting because in studies, young people are not saying they hate their families or they want to run away from their families, except in a minor kind of way. <laughs> But they also want to feel that they, they're realizing and satisfying something that's deeply about the self. And I think what that means, too, is kind of is up for grabs. I mean, I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now. Thanks. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is a testament to Connor's performance <laughs> <laughs> uh, always in favor of the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> One of the characters in that is, is the gentleman. And he, he plugs into this Shakespearean vision of the future and says that I am a citizen of the world and, and uh, I'm going to be the golden age of higher planes. And that's a viewpoint that's popular for about 10 years or so. Uh, popular in intelligence circles. And, and then, then it could develop and I think most people appreciate that this say that they are seeking to a kind of domain to, among Japanese youth, that they no longer take part in it, that they need to identify with, with Japan and, and uh, stop apologizing uh, for, for their ways of the past and so forth, and, and to move away from this and to kind of a sense of, well, and give Japanese youth a kind of sense that it is that they can enlighten the youth by doing those things that they can do in fact. Uh, that textbook isn't, wasn't adopted by a lot of people, but on the other hand, it did, I think, reflect a kind of, uh, a kind of a need for social capital and a kind of desire to, to uh, identify with a, 
Yeah, I mean, these are all wonderful questions, and I, I'm not sure that I can answer them. But what your question makes me think of is that something else that's happening in Japan along the lines of kind of nationalist hope or futures is investment in the GNC, the gross national cool, which is a word to refer to um, the, the, the profits made by the globalization of products like Pokemon, which in fact was originally designed, those of you, I know that there's some people in this room who have read my book and were maybe forced to in the class, <laughs> but I do appreciate it. <laughs> um, the, the, the designer of Pokemon was not a hikikimori, but he was certainly not in the model of Japan Inc. I mean, he started um, taking money from his mother and playing hooky from school when Space Invaders, you know, the, the arcade come to, came to his town when he was in the seventh grade. And he got through high school, but then he didn't go any further. And he designed this thing because he was totally impassioned by it, maybe like becoming a comedian, like Chihara Jr. And then he created this thing that, you know, so a lot of money. And starting in about 2000, 2001, a lot of Japanese government leaders got the idea that this is a really good thing for Japan. And I was at a conference, you know, with a, with a ministry, you know, someone from the foreign ministry, who to give his talk about Japanese soft power, pulled out a little stuffed animal of Pikachu <laughs> and a little stuffed animal of Kitty-chan and said, this, these are, these things are Japan's future. This is Japan's future. And someone else said, yeah, these promote goodwill. Not only are they producing a lot of money, they promote goodwill because when they travel to a place like South Korea, well, you know, in Korea, there's still like kind of bad memories. But if we could get them to bond to Pokemon, maybe we could kind of forget about that past. So, so Pokemon as the, the cultural diplomat of and for, you know, the Japanese nation that does not want to think about the past. So that's, that, that, I'm not answering your question, except there's a lot of rhetoric now about the GNC, about products that are cool, that you would think are this kind of underside or a flip side or another side to the lament that is being um, also heard about what's the matter with Japanese youth, they're not thinking about the future. And yet a future of something like Pokemon is being seen to be actively productive of possibly Japan's future. So yeah, I mean, I, these are interesting times. I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see where Japan's at and where the family and youth are at and where we're all at <laughs> in a few years. Thanks. Yeah. Think word. <laughs> a good thing that will become more acceptable for students to do this path other than becoming a uh, corporate zombie, as they say, and um, choosing a more artistic path and striking out on our own and doing the Steve Jobs thing and whatever else? Um, I, I mean, yeah. I, I think that this is a moment of possible change. So you have someone like Chihara Jr who left school, couldn't make it in school, was tormented in school, and school tormented him. And he was what's called a hikikimori. And there are a lot of hikikimori, in, you know, at least a million. Um, and his story is a pretty good story. I mean, he, he does something that's pretty unique and individualized, becomes successful, apparently still talks to his family. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, I think there are people who both still believe in the social contract, although even if you do that, there's no guarantee that there will be a job there. And I do think we have to be careful not to say that necessarily everyone who chose that old path became zombies, because there are a lot of people who felt that being a part of a company for years gave them some sort of security and social networks and visibility and identity that was a good thing. That, that now young people don't even really have that choice. I mean, even if they wanted that social contract, I mean, they might abide by the social contract, but there's no promise that they're gonna get that job at the end of it. So then you have this rise of people like Frita, and the numbers in 2003 were three million, and on the rise 
of going from job to job to job, but that doesn't provide a whole lot of security either. So if you work in a 7-Eleven for one year, that might be okay. If you're still working there 20 years later, your salary hasn't risen very high. And so I think a lot of young people, too, might think at some level, okay, I don't really want to be committed to Honda for the rest of my life and become a Saturday man. On the other hand, I don't really want to be still living at home 20 years from now as a Frita and having no other options. So this whole category of Frita is also just recently, I mean, there's more discourse about the Frita and, yeah. So again, I think these are times that are really interesting. And I think that I don't quite know what the future is going to be, but I think these are exactly the questions that people are going to be confronted with. Yeah. Yeah. Have you considered objectively comparing Japanese society with American society? It seems like that there are some similarities. Our divorce rate is after all 50%, while theirs is only 30%. That's true. <laughs> That's true. That's <laughs> true. Well, you know, compare, yeah, Compari comparisons are really interesting because also why don't we have a word like Frita? I mean, a lot of people don't get hooked up to jobs that last for longer than a year or two. Um, so the fact that there's a national and public discourse about Frita is also kind of interesting in Japan. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the relationship of family, I think, um, again, there are other people in the room who could maybe speak to this, but... The family in Japan, you know, there are overlaps and there are differences with the family in the United States. A lot of kids, I think, in the United States, being a mother of two kids who are now in their early 20s, when they hit 18, staying at home is not really a big, is not high on their list. When both had to come home at one point, they said, oh, this is so bad that I have to be at home. I mean, we have a great relationship, but staying at home is not what I think a lot of American kids want to do in their early 20s, although I'm, I'm hearing that a lot of kids after they graduate from college, in fact, are returning to home because they don't have another option. So, and for maybe the same sets of reasons. I mean, these are risky times. These are really risky times. I teach at Duke and my kids, my students at Duke, feel the risk. They say, you know, when they're ready to graduate, they say, I have to find a job right away because I, it's too unsettling for me not to do that. So yeah, I think that these times of kind of economic risk are shared in both Japan and the United States, and the responses maybe are, are somewhat different. Um, yeah, Linda. I mean, these are, these are great questions. Um, yeah, I, I, my sense is that things are also kind of changing. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who say the whole notion of family, the whole notion of, of marriage is beginning to shift. I, um, I, I worked with a grad student in Japan who's doing a project on extramarital affairs by married women and says that that's going up. I mean, women who are no longer willing to sacrifice a certain sense of desire, even though they're married. Um, the divorce rate, I was shocked that the divorce rate was so high. That seemed incredibly high. So if traditionally, yeah, the family has been very much centered around the, the parent-child, particularly the mother-child bond, and less so the, the marital relationship, yeah, Will things start to change now? My sense is yes, but to what direction? I don't know. The thing about the intensity between the mother and child um, is, I think, still true. But it's interesting, the two cases I talk about murder, <laughs> intrafamilial murder, are a child and a son, in particular, killing a mother. And I think one of the reasons is not that it's not an effectively loaded relationship. It's because it's an effectively loaded relationship. And I think what happens, and, and what I have written about in the past, is that relationship. I mean, a mother, I was a mother, one of my, I am a mother. Um, I 
you know, one of my sons went to nursery school, as you know, for 15 months, and I kind of understood all the pressures that, that a Japanese mother has. I mean, we have these two in America, too. But you're supposed to be there, and you are supposed to be a cushion for your child, and you're also supposed to be the conduit enforcing all of that social stuff. So you make your lunchbox, you make it so they will eat it, they will eat it in the time period they're supposed to, and they are going to integrate well into that nursery school. And if you fail to do that, you're also responsible, as I was with my child, who at first was not eating his obenta. <laughs> and I was roundly scolded by the teacher saying, what is the matter? You're not, you know. And when I invited the teacher to our house, she came with omiyage, a little gift for me, which were two obento cookbooks. <laughs> so I got the message. <laughs> I was supposed to be better. So, but what is that? It's always a double-edged sword, which is in part what I'm trying to talk about. I mean, what happens if you have a relationship where you take away that social contract? Could you? I mean, do we? I mean, most of us who are parents want our kids to do well. We want them to be happy and healthy. We want them to do well, too. So in part, I think this is where the tension is. And so is there another relationship? Is there another model for affect in Japan? That's, I mean, and I get a sense that a lot of people think no. I mean, that is the model. So that's why it's, again, that's why it's so loaded. So could you have another model? I mean, one thing I didn't talk about, and I don't have time to talk about now, but there's really interesting work being done about how youth are communicating with other youth, kind of the sociality of communication over k -tai. I mean, it's incredibly intense. Kids stay on 24-7, plugged into their phones. I mean, they're constantly in touch, talking. They're constantly plugged in. And according to kids, that's, that itself can be kind of risky, because if you don't get the messages coming in, you think you're a failure. If you get them coming in, you are obliged to answer. And so there are, I think there's also new kinds of affect, you know, uh, affective relationships that are, are coming out of this particularly technologized era, too. So again, I think there are things, I think there's a lot happening. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, um, the question about suicide, I actually don't know what the statistics are about suicide. I mean, it's pretty sensationalized, as you're right, as is the example. I mean, not everyone kills their mom, and certainly not everyone puts mom's head in a bag <laughs> and goes to car. Okay, I, mean, I was just, the story, you know, the story just struck me as, as kind of uh, interesting and rich for, um, for, for thinking about. Suicide, I don't know how prevalent it is, but you do have examples of suicide, of, for example, going on a suicide site and trying to find a buddy with whom to commit suicide together. And youth will do this, uh, as well as middle-aged people will do this, um, which is maybe more prevalent than matricide um, and is indicative of something. Yeah, I mean, why would you want to have friendship before you commit suicide? I mean, that's... That's interesting. But your other question about are not these feelings or emotions or anxieties prevalent in all post-industrialized places, probably, then, then should we talk about that being a condition of what global capitalism or you know, technologized 21st century, or whatever we call it, and then think about how in Japan for other reasons, like what Linda was talking about, that they're, they're there's histories, there's literature, there's stories about family and, and mother-son, you know, mother-child relationships. Maybe that's a way to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be an interesting way to do it. But then it also gets back to the question that Allison has, too, is in this particular moment, we're also, I mean, where's culture in all this? Because so many places are going beyond the nation state or becoming a part of the global and, um, and Japanese are purview to that, too. So, I mean, this is complicated, and I haven't worked it all out yet, as I warned you. I'm just at the beginning of this. So I'm trying to figure out what might be productive direction to go in. So thank you. I think you should wrap this up. Okay. I'm sorry. See, okay. We'll catch you in the TV section later. Okay, thank you. But thank you all for coming. It's 1.30. I want to let Thanks. you go. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.